Have you ever thought of building an online business, wondered about scaling it, and also incorporating physical locations and all of the things that go with that? Today, we're joined by Deirdre Shen. She's the founder of Growth Boss, a leading mentorship program for online business owners wanting to scale to multiple six and seven figures using the power of tribe building, funnels, and human connection. She's a serial entrepreneur. She's lived in various places around the world. And today, we're going to talk about her story and a lot of what she's going through in building her business. Mm -hmm. So with that, thanks for listening. Welcome to Bowties in Business. As always, I'm your host, Tim Kubiak. You can find us at bowtiesinbusiness.com or bowtiesnbiz on Facebook and Twitter. You can find me everywhere as at Tim Kubiak. With that, Deirdre, thanks for being here. and Welcome to the show. Hi, Tim. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> yep. So one of the things that I found so fascinating when we first started talking was not only are you a serial entrepreneur, but you had physical locations. So a lot of people build an online business and say, oh, yeah, great. I'm going to be a drop shipper or this or that. So can we start with that part of your story? Yeah, for sure. Gosh, that's um, that was over eight years ago now, <laughs> which is insane to, to think about. I mean, we still have those businesses. So let me back up a little bit in terms of how we got there, if, if you don't mind. But um, <laughs> so... It was at the time of my life. So I, I actually opened that first business. It was a dessert bar um, with my then partner. He's now my husband. And what had happened was I was at the time I was in a corporate, you know, as a lot of us are in, in my corporate job, I was in banking. And um, I was, I realized even sort of early on in my career that corporate wasn't going to be the thing for me um, because I was fortunate enough to be working on this really big pro program of work that gave me access to you know senior executives all the way to the CEO um, as well but I was in these sitting in these rooms and I was seeing like the conversations that were happening the politics the back channeling and I was like even at that time I was like you know what this isn't this isn't kind of the path that I want to go down I don't, I don't want to have to become this person <laughs> you have a soul <laughs> yeah exactly I, I'll say because I played that game <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, and at the same time, so I kind of was in this mindset of, okay, like I knew that corporate wasn't going to be the path for me. So, but I didn't really know what was, um, and at the same time, my, as I said, my partner, we just moved out, um, of home, um, and he had sort of found, uh, this love of, um, cooking and baking and specifically because I love dessert. He was trying to perfect this, um, this amazing dessert for me that I just loved, <laughs> Um, and it was actually called, it was this like molten lava cake. We would just go to this Italian, this one Italian restaurant I remember all the time just to get this dessert. And so he was trying to perfect this dessert for me. Um, he was actually studying medicine at the time and was miserable. So he was hating it. And so I think we were both in this like, what like what are we gonna do with the rest of our lives um you know the, they call it the quarter quarter life crisis um <laughs> and <laughs> and so um it kind of stemmed from there really where we were incredibly obviously I, I think you have to be to start a business we were incredibly naive about what it would take um especially a brick and mortar business but we did it anyway we with very little savings, um, we opened up our first store. It was a, a little, you know, a little store um, selling desserts. And we kind of wanted to create a, the type of place that we would want to go with our friends, with ourselves, like on date nights, um, things like that. And wow, like we had these, I remember when we, even before we first opened, we had these big visions of what this thing was going to be. Um, it was obviously going to be massive. It was obviously, it is incredibly great product, like the best dessert. Um, and so we were like, oh, we better be ready. We're going to get our doors beaten down because <laughs> the flood of people. Everybody's gonna... just going to know, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know where this store is going. <laughs> um, because as you can probably tell, that did not happen. <laughs> that did not happen. I was hoping um, I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, for, for some reason, Tim, the whole build it and they will come concept just doesn't it doesn't work I, well how wh why <laughs> <laughs> so yes that was our first foray into business and it was incredibly disappointing to hit you know to have reality hit and realize that actually we have to put a bit of work into making to getting the word out there to actually getting ourselves known um and 
it was, you know, you know, I, I kind of laugh about it now, but at the time it was incredibly lonely, you know, when we were only doing, we were bleeding money. Like we were only doing, you know, hundred dollars a day, $200 a day. Um, and we're having to pay rent. We're having to pay wages, you know, like it's so, you know, when you talk about brick and mortar business, like that is kind of the downside with a brick and mortar business is that you're actually on the hook for, <laughs> you know, for these relatively large expenses. Um, and then there was, um, there was this moment that I actually remember, it was a few months into opening um, that business and we were on these, one of the rare few date nights that we could actually both take the night off um and we were we were at my favorite um sushi place Japanese place and we get a call from one of our team members our staff members who, who was working and at the time because we weren't that busy we only had two people on um and he was kind of like um guys I don't have the time right now but you have to come in like like we need your help and we're like, oh my God, what is happening? You know, is, you know, have they lost power? Like what's going on? And so we're like, run, we race to the car and like we hop in and we're driving to, um, to the store. And I had to, I dropped my, my, my husband off um, so that I could go find parking. And I still remember to this day, like how the place looked because Tim, it was packed. Um, I like, it was, it was. Um... <laughs> was that the first time you really saw it packed? It was, yes, it was I, like, I kind of, you know, you have these, I have these visions before of like, wouldn't it be awesome if we ever got to this point where there would, there would actually be a line, for, you know, of people, you know, waiting, waiting um, outside and to actually see it come to life. I was like, I, I don't know. There was a part of me that I felt like I didn't believe that it would happen maybe, but it was like, Oh, it was it was it was beautiful chaos you know it's like one of those things where it was like completely chaotic because our poor staff members were like running back and forth and you know trying to take orders and do all the things and um but it was like from there it felt like this it, we had turned the corner um and it was kind of you know then then thinking about the next thing and the next thing and the next thing um and so we were fortunate because I know that a lot of businesses especially bricks and mortar brick and mortar businesses you know when like I think the statistic something's like the like fifty percent of businesses actually don't make it past the first twelve months. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so you know we were we were quite fortunate that we were able to actually get that kind of momentum going. Um, but it took it took a while and it took a lot of loneliness, a lot of stress, a lot of you know trying like trying to figure out what we had to do to actually get it working. Um, but we finally did and it was amazing it, it was amazing so that was our first business um and <laughs> since then we've grown that business to um we grew that business to five locations um there's a dessert bar called the chocolate um we also opened a burger restaurant so we have two locations both all of them in sydney by the way um <laughs> there, are, there are worse places in the world to own businesses right <laughs> Yeah, so and they're still operating, but then we made the move over to New York City like 18 months ago, and uh, that's been a wild ride. Um, but yeah, since then, and then we've kind of um, diverted our attention to online, and I just love the online world because it's just so, it just feels like the opportunities are so limitless. Um, there's a lot of fun to be had online, but, you know, similar to, like, it's it's similar but different problems, right, with brick and mortar, yeah. like, different problems but it's all similar um it's all different all around the same themes I would say um you know you still have such satur a massive saturation massive amount of competitors you know unfortunately you don't have um, like a physical presence you don't have that just traffic that, there's no you know, foot traffic right yeah exactly yeah. exactly so um it's been really it's been really fun figuring out the the online world as well <laughs> So in the online world, instead of paying for real estate and utilities, right, are you paying for drop shippers and inventory in a different way? Is that the mix? Um, I think it's more, so yes, there is. It depends on the business model that, um, that you go down. Um, so obviously for some people, it is, it is, in, it is in inventory. Um, I would highly recommend that if anyone is just starting out that they don't invest in inventory as much as possible um, until they've proven out their model <laughs> um and but so i think but i think really where it is is um you you're kind of sacrificing the upfront investment in capital 
with, as I said, the the fact that you're not getting foot traffic. So you actually have yeah. to invest a lot more time and money in going out and finding that traffic and getting it to your store. So that's kind of the trade-off that I would I would say um, is kind of the difference. How do you build in an online world? And this is something that's always been curious to me. How do you build loyalty like you would with a brick and mortar? Yeah, it's and this is um, it's it's pretty much the same concept. Um, and this is why I say it's like different, you know. <laughs> so you're um, in their inbox instead of they drive by your shop. Is that? Yeah, yeah. So there's all different ways. Um, so loyalty to me is really about, and that's why my strategy. Um, and you, um, you kind of called it out at the the very beginning. Is a big part of it is human connection. Um, and because we kind of think that, oh, okay, if we're going to be online, we therefore don't need to connect with people. Um, right. And, you know, I, I talk to a lot of, um, especially new e-commerce entrepreneurs and they're like, well, I wanted to do this because I'm an introvert and I don't want to talk to people. <laughs> and unfortunately, <laughs> you're going to find that <laughs> if you have a business, you're going to have to talk to people um, and you're going to, and not just talk to people, but connect with people. Um, and more and more, that is actually what's going to become your differentiator online is that actual human connection. So that, and that is really how you build loyalty. So if I kind of, um, do you want me to kind of go into that in a little bit? More that time? would be awesome. Yeah. Cause yeah. I want to learn I'm selfish. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, basically this, there's loyalty to, um, to your brand and to your product. There's, and there's also loyalty to you and who you are. And I think you, if you can also hit almost all of those points, that's when you really tr build true loyalty. Um, and so that's why I tell all my clients and people in my community that you have to show up for your audience. You have to, you know, you have to, you have to actually connect with them because while, you know, they might come to you because of your product, they might initially come to you because of your product. And actually my mentor, an old mentor of mine told me this, um, they actually stay with you because of the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and that's true whether or not it's, brick and mortar that's true whether or not you're offering a service that's true whether or not you're offering a product like whatever business you're in this is always going to be the case because at the end of the day we're human and humans are like <laughs> we we are built we we are wired we're hardwired to want relationships even if we think that we don't even if we think that we yeah. don't um, so how that plays out in the online space is obviously you want to be adding value to your audience and to your customers because they will, people only really, um, buy and then keep buying from people or brands that they know, like, and trust. Um, and so for them to know, like, and trust you, you need to be serving them first, um, and then continue serving them whether that looks like it's from a customer service perspective, whether that looks like you're um, providing uh, sort of, I call it educational, but I don't really mean it in the traditional sense of the word, but however that you can provide more value to them um, to get them to the result that they're after, mm -hmm. whether that's you solving, helping them solve a problem or whether that's you helping them achieve a goal, um, you wanna be providing them value in that journey. You want to be part of that journey because that's really how they're going to become loyal to you. Um, and so I really love um, human connection to do this. Um, and when I say human connection, that could be, you know, that could be you showing up live on Instagram or um, building a community through Facebook group. Um, that could also be being in their inbox um, and really showing your personality because that's really how people vibe with you, right? It's you being authentic to who you are um, and, and showing them an insight into, in, into you. That's, that's what they're really buying into. Um, so I don't know if you had any experiences around this as well, Tim, but. So I have a really weird one, right? I, I have a company and it's, you never hear me say my company's name. Right. I, I am my own brand, right? right. This is what I do, I'm my own brand. Everything goes into that. Yeah, there's yeah. a website for the company. Yeah, that's who pays the taxes. Yeah. But it's sometimes it's really funny. So I'll get through a thing and I'll say, okay, and that's going to be X hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'm going to send you the invoice from 
Venture 412. And they're like, no, no, we're, we're hiring you. Yeah, yeah, but I need to be able to bill you, right? <laughs> Don't make the check out to Tim, make it out to here. <laughs> yeah, totally. And I think that's the thing. I think when we when we start businesses, because we have these visions and we have this end goal to be like the next Sephora or the next, yeah. you know, like big brand, we immediately think, oh, it has to be a brand. It has to be this schmick professional thing that, because otherwise, how are people going to going to trust us? Right. But actually, when we're starting out, you know, those, you know, Sephora didn't start as Sephora and, you know, become like immediately no. get to that point. Um, and I think that's a bit that a lot of us miss when we first start out is that actually people want to know you. People want to know the founder. People want to know who they're buying from. People want to know the why behind you, why you created what you created. Um, people want to know how um, how you can actually help them, and like as like you know almost yeah. from a personal perspective. Um, and so we do kind of have to go through this phase where we are the the faces of our brands. We are the person until we get into you know, and ultimately we all want to get there to, you know, mass adoption where, where then our brand becomes, because then we have teams of people, you know, behind us and things like that. And then it is, it does become our brand so much. You can still be the face of it, but it becomes more about the brand. And I think it's like, we miss that step because we see where we want to be, where we want to get to, which is awesome, but that's actually not where we need to start out. Um, so yeah, so I to yeah. So anyway, I love I love human connection for this because um, that's really the only way that people are going to buy into you and and what you sell. I don't know if I, that answered your question. That felt like a really long answer to your question. No, it, it so it did right. And so I think that's the thing. So my youngest daughter is 22 now, but I watched her and you talk about Instagram, and I'm not at the influencer level, but at people that were building beauty brands and brands that catered to her demographic when she was in her mid-teens and later teens yeah. she identified with the founders and i and i can't believe that it was unique so it's like here's what i make here's why i make it here's this here's that it yeah. wasn't i'm buying chanel i'm buying armani i'm buying yeah. this she was buying them exactly exactly and their values their totally values. Yeah. yeah and that's why i love human care so that's kind of you know i think that's the starting point um so for everyone who's looking to build loyalty online that's a starting point and then obviously there are other um I, I call them like tactics um and tricks that you can kind of build that so like you know whether that's through loyalty programs whether that's through um i call them like social proof funnels so like how do you actually start to um gain and gather the social proof because online that's actually that's incredibly important um to again as a trust factor to get people to trust you and and, and what you're selling um and i really really love using facebook groups actually for more and more for product-based businesses because building that community online and having them not only talk to you because and that this is where I find Instagram is great and it's a great visual platform but where it lacks is that um, you know you, you're kind of pushing things out to people and yeah they can comment back and that feels like engagement but it's not true engagement whereas in a group not only can they engage with you um, but they can engage with each other. And that's really the, that's where you start to get the social proof happening. Um, yeah. I've seen awesome things happen where like literally people like um, this, this is probably going to sound bad, but I don't mean in a bad way, but there was almost like peer pressure happening for people to buy this end product because, you know, people in the group were like, oh, you've got to buy it. You've, this is amazing. You've got to try it. Like, you know, um, so it wasn't peer pressure in a bad way, but like, that's just what happens when you have, when you bring these people together. Um, they end up selling for you, which is amazing. My best customers are people that have been brought to me by my other customers. It's, exactly. you know, yeah. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, so I love, so, you know, definitely it starts with you always online, um, but then you start to leverage, you know, your loyal customers, um, your, your raving fans, um, and you start to um, systemize how that can happen which is why i call them the social proof funnels because you know it's it's really about how do you how do you get the how do you get that generating you know almost organically and evergreen um in a way so so i really love it. and then you can start to share that you you share that in your email like your email campaigns you share that on your other social media platforms like just everywhere you know you can start to actually you know promote these these great things that people are saying about you <laughs> So let, let's start before you get to that point. So in your dessert shop to start, 
it took a while around that corner, right? Yeah. When you start sharing and building content for an online business, how long does it take to round the corner till you have that first slam night where you got to leave date night? <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to caveat. Okay. So I'll I'll talk I'll talk you through what happened with the chalk pot, and then and um I'll, I'm going to make a few caveats because this was you know seven eight years ago, right? That right. this that we we had this kind of happened, the um, rounding the corner and seeing the the amazing chaos that was happening at our store. And why I say, you know, seven, why this is important is because we um, were at that inflection point of um, sort of at the time, bloggers were a big thing. And it's not to say that bloggers aren't still, you know, um, really popular but now. Videos but videos killed the blog. Yeah. And, and also, and also Instagram, right, was yeah. starting to really make that rise. Um, and so at the time we kind of, we, what we had done was we had leveraged, um, other people's audiences. So we had bloggers coming in more and more. They were like, we're actually either transitioning or they were also exploring Instagram as a channel, um, to reach their audience. So we had people who, like I, I guess influencers um, in today's mm -hmm. language, sort of you know posting about us. We had bloggers coming, and that was happening for a while, like for for months, for a few months. So it wasn't like anyone is going to make you an instant success. But I think what had happened was it was building momentum, and because we kept at it, and this is again another mistake that I see a lot of people, new business owners, make is that they try it once. The thing doesn't work and it's like oh well that didn't work I, you know i have to go on and try the next thing and it's like well no <laughs> you know like like with everything and um you have to stick with it for a period of time because yeah. it's it's a it's always a volume game right anything in sales and marketing is always volume whether or not your it's volume from a customer perspective or whether it's volume from an influencer perspective right it's always going to be a volume game but um the other thing too is what happens when you're leveraging other people's audiences is that yeah, they might hear about you from one, but then it's still like, well, I don't really know, you know, I don't really know, like, and trust that, you know, that person that you're trying to, trying to tell me to. But if I then hear, hear about them from like this other person and this other person, this other, and I'm like, oh, like suddenly it's like they, they've just invaded my feed. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, okay, I need to start paying attention to this. Um, and that's the kind of momentum that you start building when you stick with a strategy. Um, and so at that time, that was the strategy that we had used was um, essentially influencer marketing. So we had bloggers coming in, we had Instagrammers um, that was happening for a few you know, weeks, a few months. Um, and then I think it was that, that it was that momentum that was being built that really kind of put us on the map. Um, now, so that's it. And the reason why I say I caveat that is because that was when Instagram was kind of just really taking off. Um, so it kind of feels like we were fortunate because we rode that Instagram wave um, for, for a bit. Whereas now you look at Instagram and it is so saturated. It is, it is incredibly hard to grow a huge following um, because it's, it's just too much on there <laughs> just well, it was so much well, it's on not my pictures of flowers intermixed with business <laughs> stuff that isn't growing it for me okay that's good to know <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah i just see i just see photos of like kittens and puppies now that's, <laughs> that's my yeah. i'll put up the sales thing and then the next thing you have is oh look my flower is blooming <laughs> so yeah, I'm that guy. <laughs> yeah um and so um Okay, yeah, I'm just trying to remember what the question. Sorry, was. I totally took you off topic. <laughs> so you, you rode the Instagram wave. Yeah, yeah. And so now, is right. Yeah, so now we're talking about today. Um, influencer marketing can 100% still work, um, but it's going to be finding where, like, a where your audience is, um, and then and b again, the the time might look different. So it's not going to be a matter of like a few weeks. It might be longer than that, um, but it also might be about. Um, exploring other platforms not to say that you have to be on there so for example i'm not saying you have to be on like tiktok for, you know but I if that's, dance, that's out. <laughs> oh i reckon you could totally do like a bow tie tutorial like a really i, re I reckon that'd be cool yeah you know i'm, I'm considering twitch as a sideline right now right oh, there you go. yeah um so as long as like you know your audience is on there um Cause that's going to be one thing, right? Like I know that TikTok is a slightly younger demographic, but even in saying that they yeah. are, 
they are becoming older um, and there are more people in the older demographics being getting on there as well. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like exploring all of these other different platforms that you can leverage, not to say that you have to be on there, but again, that you can leverage people who are already on there and their audiences um, to help you get the word out there. And so that's one, like, I would say that's one strategy is kind of like, how do you leverage other people's audiences? And it's a, you know, it's, it's one that I, I think would, will never go away. Um, I think the different platforms will change, but you know, the concept of leveraging people's audiences will never go away because that's really how, even in the, back in the day when newspapers were a thing, yeah. <laughs> right. That was, that was again, getting put into a newspaper was just a form of leveraging people's audience, like leveraging that audience. So it really, it's going to be, you know, to, you know, the, the ends of the earth, like it's, it's always going to be a really, really core strategy. I think that everyone has to have in place. Um, it just, it's just the mediums will change. Um, sorry, were you going to ask a question? You, you just gave me a thought I've never had before, which yeah. isn't that uncommon. But um, So I was just thinking about it. As you're talking about, you know, whether it was writing Instagram or TikTok and, you know, there was Vines in there and YouTube and everything else. It's really not much different that in this country, you used to have four major or three major television networks. And then you got a fourth and then you had your local UHF. And now you have cable and streaming and everything else where your audience has gotten narrowed for you. And th these platforms may be doing that same thing just in a different realm. Is that? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I, that totally makes sense. Um, and yeah. And, and not only, not only that, but I think it's like in the same way that, I mean, it's kind of different because obviously these, these cape, these networks probably don't have like algorithms that are you know, like also changing all the time, but yeah. um <laughs> but what they do have is they, they have other things that change, right? They have like may, maybe not viewership, but like maybe um, areas that they get they get um, shown in or, or whatever. Right. Like so there's always things changing, which is kind of similar to, again, these platforms as well. There's always these things changing um, that you kind of have to keep tabs on and almost like change with them or like move with them. You have to be fluid in that way. Um because I kind of get asked as well, like, um, oh, well, you know, I have, you know, hundreds or even thousands of followers on my Facebook page, you know, why, you know, it, but it still just doesn't seem to do anything. Um, and the reason why is because when you look at what Facebook strategy is, you kind of have to go with that. And their strategy, exactly, right? It's all about the money. It's all about the money. And the only way that you're going to be able to get any of your posts shown from your Facebook page is if you pay for it. If you pay for it to get shown. Um, but this is, and this is a reason, why, another reason why I really like groups is because their strategy has moved into building communities. Like they're very upfront about that. They have ads <laughs> running about it, right? Sure, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, about Build a group, about, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, and so you kind of want to be able to not fight against, because that's, a, that's you know you're going to lose by trying to fight against it. You just need to be able to, go, go with it, um, yeah. is, you know, go with the tide where, where they're trying to, to get you. And so that's why I really like groups because again, it's another, it, that they're trying to get pe more people into groups. Um, and so if you want your post to be shown, if you want, you know, um, more people to see what you have to say, then, Hey, that's the strategy. So go do that. Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of, um, anyway, I sort of went off topic there, but, <laughs> but like, you, all good. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So to answer your very, very original question, is it going to take months? <laughs> online? Yeah. Yeah. How do you get to that breakthrough moment? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of going to be, um, a mix of all of these things. So I actually have, um, I actually have what I call like the, the traffic pyramid. Um, and there's kind of like four tiers, um, to it. So the first is like pretty much what everyone is at least doing, which is what I call like passive organic marketing. Um, and that's kind of like you have an Instagram feed or an Instagram page, maybe a Facebook page, and you just post things. And again, people think that by the act of posting, they're going to suddenly get traffic. And that's kind of me going, we've opened our brick and mortar shop, we've opened the doors and we're suddenly going to get traffic. <laughs> and people probably know by now that that's not how it works. Um, because what you're doing is you're being very passive 
right? You're, you're just kind of putting things out there and you're just waiting for people to hopefully stumble across you and that just doesn't work. Um, so then you kind of get going to the second tier, which is um, leveraging other people's audiences. So that's kind of what I spoke about, which is, okay, how do you start to, again, like leverage other people to help you get the word out there? Um, and then you have the third tier, um, and this is really what I call active organic outreach, uh, okay, active organic marketing, which is all about outreach. Um, and this is incredibly painful and incredibly daunting for a lot of people. But this is kind of like me being um, at my dessert bar, literally going out to people who are like coming, like are walking in front of my store and being like, yep. hey, I have a sample of a brownie here. Would you like to try it? right like right. you know and we all have to we all have to do this but we for some reason when we're online we think oh well no we don't have to actually talk to anyone <laughs> it's because we've been sold the lie that the algorithm will love us if we build good content and everyone will show up yeah and that's just not true that's just <laughs> absolutely it's not true and so um and so this is a big part of like what i like part of strategy as well is like actually go out and find some of your audience. And the reason why this is important is yes, you can get sales off it totally, but also because then when you're scaling to the, now the top of my pyramid of my traffic pyramid, which is where you're starting to scale with ads, you, if you do not understand who your audience is, um, you know, what their interests are, what their behaviors are, what are the things that they like, what are, you know, what are their goals, what all of that stuff. If you do not know that you are going to be spending a lot of money trying to find that through ads and so if you don't want to be wasting a lot of money trying to find you know your audience through ads then you're going to have to do a bit of groundwork to actually get that information and then off the back of that you can scale it through ads so that's kind of my traffic pyramid um, four tiers to it passive organic marketing leveraging other people's audiences active organic marketing and then scaling with ads um, but you've got to hit a point before you start spending on ads. Is that a fair view? So what was that? You've got to. You have to have the, some of those other things in place, yes. unless you've got endless cash to burn, right? Totally. Before you oh, start yeah. dumping it into ads. Um, yes, unless you have, unless you're fortunate enough to have, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars to be, you know, essentially wasting trying to find your audience, then yeah, you have to have the rest of it in place. And the reason why I kind of so. The, how the, the pyramid works is that it ideally you want all you want all of those tiers working for you yeah. um, because that's really how you're going to have you're going to be building out your robust traffic system to actually get people to your store or to converting to whatever it is you, wherever you want them to get to um, so yeah so <laughs> um, I know that was again another roundabout way of answering your question um, I can't actually put you know it's going to take months so it's going because really it's going to take the amount of time it takes for you to actually start implementing each of those tiers um, and putting the time and effort into doing to to, to making those work um, but yeah so but that's kind of my strategy in a nutshell in a pyramid nutshell <laughs> around how to actually start to source your traffic um that that you want that you want to get in and to, it, it actually aligns with your point earlier which was don't do something once and then try to do something else there's got to be some right. consistency right totally yes you have to have your foundation and you know and i kind of um i'm also at pains to say even though the bottom tier is, you know, that passive organic marketing and, you know, it could be on any platform. So it could be on Instagram, it could be on Facebook, it could be on TikTok and or YouTube or wherever. I'm also pains to say, like, don't try to be everywhere at once <laughs> because, <laughs> again, this is where dabbling comes in, which is to that point of like, oh, well, if something's not working, I'll go on to the next thing, on to the next thing, on to the next thing. Um, you have to be consistent at one in, in at least one place. Um, build your muscle memory yeah. there. And then once you've built your muscle memory, then you can add on to that um, and then add on to that and then, and then add on to that. Um, because I think that's also a really important thing um, that I just wanted to point out because again, it's daunting. Um, there are a lot of platforms that we could all be on and I don't, I definitely don't recommend that it, you be on every platform <laughs> because it's, it's so, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's unmanageable. It is. Yeah. It's totally unmanageable. Um, but you want to have that foundation in place because ultimately people are going to go to those places to see if you're credible. Are you a real business? Who are you? You know, if you want to work with influencers, they're going to look at your, go to, want to go to your 
social media and be like, I want to see who this person's about. So you have to have this foundation in place um, for any of the, the other parts of the pyramid to work. Um, and so, so they all do stack and you do want to be able to be traversing all of them to be able to yeah, have a robust marketing system, a, a marketing machine working for you. Yeah, and you, what, one of the things I watch as I work with founders, as I work with even established companies is people who are closer to their customer and understand their customers wants do so much better. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Pe people who work in their own echo chamber and say, I'm going to build this and it's going to be brilliant and the world needs it. Sometimes they're the richest guys, right? <laughs> but most of us aren't Elon Musk. Yes. Uh, he was exactly who came to mind when you said that too. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you look at it and yeah, when you have his money, you can do that and you can make a market. But for the most part, and I'm not downplaying innovation, right? I, I made my living in tech for nearly three decades. But at the end of the day, there has to be a reason to have the people want what you're making or what you're selling. Yes, 100%. Yeah. Um, and, and that's why I always recommend, like, as much as possible, don't invest in inventory. Um, so one of my other, <laughs> I'll tell you another story. So when we moved to New York, actually, I moved with my, um, my husband, my cat, and my co-founder. Um, <laughs> nice. And, and um, the business that my co-founder and I were actually working on was a fashion tech business. Um, and, you know, in our minds, it was like, oh, this is going to be awesome. We're totally solving a problem that people have. Um, and, but we also knew that, you know, it, because of my experience of build it and they will come doesn't necessarily work all the time yeah. that we shouldn't just be building it um, because, you know, more often than not, they probably won't, won't come. Yeah. And so what we actually did was rather than investing the money upfront to get this thing developed because it was a technology business. So it was going to take a lot of, you yeah, know, so you got to get the minimum viable product, right? Exactly. exactly. We actually um, hit the pavement. And um, at the time we were um, targeting uh, college students or, and, or um, sort of younger corporate, like uh, younger professionals. So, you know, first job, second job out of uni kind of. Yeah, okay. exactly. Exactly. So, you know, so over here in New York. And so we went to like Columbia, we went to NYU, we went to, you know, um, to, you know, Wall Street. And we, we actually had um, conversations. And again, this is, you know, this comes back to even though it wasn't on, we weren't having them online, but we were having them, you know, back when obviously we actual could. conversations when you're yeah. allowed to. Yeah. Actual conversations with people to try to work out if this was a problem that was big enough for us to, and would they actually buy into a solution that we were thinking? Um, and what we actually, when we went through that process, what we realized was even though the problem was a problem, um, the solutions that they already had, like the, the way that they were already kind of duct taping a solution together, they were actually already happy with. And so for us, we actually failed that business, like deliberately failed that business because it wasn't going to be worth our time and money investing in it. Um, so, and this is why I say to anyone thinking of starting a business is like, to your point, like you have to go out and you have to talk to your customer and you have to know <laughs> if you're actually, if you have what they want, because otherwise you're going to be spending a, like wasting a lot of time and money either developing something or investing in inventory or something. And you don't want that. You, you don't want to be doing that. I'm going to be assuming unless you're, you're an Elon Musk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, there are a lot of people with spare bedrooms or not spare bedrooms filled with inventory they couldn't sell. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and so that's why I'm a big, big fan of test the market first. Like even if it's just taking pre-orders um, or something like without you having to actually get the inventory yet, um, test the market first. Um, and then if you can see that there is demand, then awesome, go, then you can go all, all in. Um, but really that, that whole um, product market fit is so key. Um, that is actually the whole, the reason why pretty much any business that fails, fails um, is because, at, at least in that early stage is because of that, not finding that product market fit. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because you look at, Sometimes I'll say people go down market just thinking they're going to buy business, right? And unless you have buying power, I watch people get wiped out with that. And then not just online, by the way, right? So if you've got X, you know, 
I ran a business once where we had $35 million of inventory. So if I wanted to hedge a half a million on something that I thought was going to get discontinued, because then I could have it and win other business, I couldn't actually put the price up. It was B2B, but I could just sit on it. And when the, the supply dried up, say, yeah, I'll do, I'll sell it to you. Come on, regular price, but I want the rest of the order too. You can do that. But when you're starting out, you can't play that game. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's um, <laughs> it's a very dangerous game to play. And, and I think that's the, that's the important thing, right? It's like, and this comes back to, you know, almost my, my starting point, which is have a vision as to where you want to be. And, you know, we all want to be Elon Musk, ideally, maybe, um, if that's kind of our thing. But we, but just realize that that's not where even he started. Right, that's not right. where we can start. We can't start investing to your point in thirty-five million in, in, in inventory to have, um, have hanging around. Like we just can't do that. Can. So we do have to really be intentional with what activities we actually do and the decisions that we make early on, because they can not to sound dramatic about it, but they can kind of be make or break for your business um, very early on when you have very limited resources um, to put into it. Yeah. The, the, one of the analogies I always think of is it's like the band that got famous overnight to play empty bars for 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Right. Nobody remembers that, you know, yes. uh, they're an overnight success. Yeah. They've done a thousand shows and had 1200 people show up prior yeah. to this. Totally. Totally. That's yeah. And we all have to remember that and we all have to be okay with that. Um, yeah. Because, you know, we can very easily get seduced by this whole entrepreneurship thing, but it's, really unsexy it is really really unsexy going down this road <laughs> so let, let's let's bring it to close but let's end on that if you've not run your own business and you're leaving the corporate world or you're in an earlier stage in life and you're like i don't want to work for the man right and i want to do my own thing tell people what they're really getting into by starting a company <laughs> i don't want to scare people off <laughs> i think honesty is brilliant right <laughs> Yeah, look, it is, oh, how do I encapsulate this um, into a few words? It's like, it is the, you feel all of the polarizing emotions that you can. So on the one hand, it is so incredibly lonely. Um, and like, and especially when you're in that down, which you are going to, at, like at some point, you're going to feel that down and you're, it's going to be lonely. Um, but then on the other hand, when you finally get a win, when you finally get an up, then it's like the most exhilarating. <laughs> it's like, it's literally like being on a roller coaster. Um, and I think that's the thing, like if, you know, for people going into business, I think you just have to be okay with going through these ups and downs and, and cycling through um, the good, the bad, the emotions, like all of that. Um, it's, 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 also, like I would like I wouldn't have it any other way, but I also know that it's not for everyone. Um, I also, yeah, it's you know, it's it's definitely not for anyone. anyone it's not for the faint-hearted. I should say maybe. <laughs> it, it's not right. It, yeah. I, I describe it as the highs keep getting higher, and if you're doing your job right, the lows aren't as deep into the valley. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because um, it's so true. Like as you get bigger, you just upgrade your problems, right? Like you, problems will never go away. You're just They're just getting better, bigger, new ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, 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 you know, and the, the one thing I found, I built a lot of businesses for other people is I always left them when there was no longer a victory lap. When I had big wins and it didn't feel good anymore, I was out. I knew oh, it was time to go. Yeah, totally. Totally. So yeah, so I yeah, it's it's a it's a hard one too because I love entrepreneurship, but I also know the type of um, what it takes to um, to to get through it, to be resilient, um, and it's a lot. It does take a lot. So um, that's the thing. That's what I would probably just have, try to make everyone aware of. But at the same time, it's kind of like it's hard to theoretically wrap your head around that. You kind of have to go through it to. <laughs> It's one of those things, right? Like, <laughs> and there's a lot more people out there that do it than people actually realize. Right? Yeah, yeah, totally. So, so um, where can people find you? What can they find on your site? All that kind of good stuff. Yeah, awesome. So, I actually do this. Um, if I haven't scared you off from 
<laughs> from um, trying, try, trying entrepreneurship. Um, I actually hold a three day, free three day call to convert a challenge for e commerce business owners. Um, <laughs> essentially, how to find your audience, how to hook them in, how to convert them. Um, and so I'm actually running one in a couple of weeks' time, but I run one pretty much every month. So you can sign up for that at www.thegrowthboss.com slash challenge. Um, I'd love to see you there. Um, and also, if you just want to get a little bit more of um, insight into my um, dangerous mind, then I do also have my own podcast called the Making It Podcast, uh, which I believe, Tim, you're going to be, you're going to come on as well. You've been very gracious and you're going to have me on. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, come check, check us out there. <laughs> okay. I got to ask, do you have a Facebook group they should look at too? Yes, yes. Um, so my Facebook group is called E-commerce Growth Secrets um, with Deidre Shen. So um, E-commerce Growth Secrets. Yep, yeah, definitely find me there. Um, it's awesome. I do free training every week and audits, live audits as well every week. Um, so a ton of value and we have a ton of fun. Um, so yeah, come, please come join. <laughs> I, I will join you. So awesome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for taking time. Thanks so much for sharing openly about your own journey as a business owner. You're so welcome. Thanks so much for having me on, Tim.